Hey, and welcome to the Arts District Podcast, episode 15. I'm Lauren, and uh, there's Georgia. Um, <laughs> welcome to this week's podcast. Uh, it's Saturday morning right now for me, and it's a lovely day outside, so I'm filming early so I can get out and enjoy it. Um, kind of tired, though. Last night I went to check out some live music in Burlington. Uh, there's this band called Freedom Train. They're a cover band. I've been hearing about them for years um, through friends of mine and uh, finally got to check them out and was mind blown. If you live in and around Hamilton or, uh, or Burlington, um, that was uh, at this place called Jersey's and uh, it was packed. Like it was their 25th anniversary, um, which is pretty crazy. They've been a cover band for 25 years and uh, it really shows they were absolutely incredible, so tight, and they just made everything look effortless. And needless to say, it was a very inspiring show, um, and everybody there loved it. Uh, lost people out dancing, which was great to see. Um, mainly an older crowd, I guess, people that probably grew up with them and it just followed them along throughout the years, and it was just great to see them being celebrated, you know? Um, I feel like that doesn't happen so much anymore. Like, we forget to celebrate the people that have been doing it for a long time, and. There was birthday cake and and uh, sparklers. It was a uh, it was a fun crazy time. Uh, I have a video actually. Um, maybe I'll throw it in for for fun, but uh, maybe I'll just throw in some pictures. Um, yeah, so that was Freedom Train. Uh, definitely recommend checking them out if you like listening to live music and you know cover bands are great because it gives you the opportunity to go out and hear music that you know, classic songs um, played really well. You know, often better than if you were to actually go see the the real original bands nowadays because they, uh, you know, they change it up and uh, they're a little bit weathered and, um, you know, uh, cover bands bring that original energy back to the songs and the music and it's just great. It's a lot of fun. Um, really enjoyed it. So I definitely will be going to see them more often. The guys in the band are super nice too. So that's always refreshing. Um, yeah, so that's what I did with my Friday night. Um, if any of you checked out live music and uh, enjoyed what you heard, then uh, let us know. Because, you know, I always like to go out and hear new music, and I'd like to get some ideas from our uh, listeners of the podcast. So feel free to share that with us. Um, this week, I don't have a whole lot to talk about. I was trying to find some interesting music news to talk about, but there wasn't a whole lot uh, going on in the world of music. Um, this week and last week, so other than Phil Rudd from ACDC having uh, some issues with the law and uh, there being a bunch of random articles about Dave Grohl um, from people coming out saying the, why they don't like him, which I just think silly, and I'm not going to post a link to that article because I don't endorse hating on Dave Grohl. Um, yeah, I still need to catch up with Sonic Highways too. I'm going to try and watch that this week so I can talk about my thoughts on it next week. I can't believe I haven't watched it yet. When I said, like, how many weeks ago that I was so stoked to watch it, um, definitely got to get on that. And I don't know if George has watched it yet. If she has, maybe she can talk about it. But that's something I have to do, and I feel really guilty for not having watched it yet. So got to get on that. Um, what else was there? Uh, yeah, just, I don't know, little articles. Uh, but nothing totally grasping. There was something that I wanted to look into. Apparently that, uh, you know how we landed some sort of um, robotic thing on uh, a comet? Apparently it's comet things, and I haven't looked into any of those articles to see what that really means. It's probably just like space noise that, you know, is creating weird sound waves that makes it sound like it's singing. But, you know, anything makes headlines nowadays. Uh, yeah, so moving on. I'm gonna talk about the one thing that I really wanted to talk about this week, and that's the book that I'm reading. Um, now Then and Fleetwood Mac play on Now Then and Fleetwood Mac <laughs> by Mick Fleetwood, um, co-written with uh, Anthony Baza, who's written a couple other uh, music books, actually. Uh, it's written in here. He did a biography with Slash and In Excess and Tommy Lee, and he wrote a book for uh, Eminem. So, uh, Definitely a solid writer in, when it comes to like music journalism. Uh, and it's a really good book. I'm really, really enjoying it. Um, Mick Fleetwood came out with a book like in the late 80s, early 90s, I think it was. I think it was called like My Life and Times in Fleetwood Mac. And I think at that point in time, he was still kind of heavy into 
you know, drug and alcohol abuse, and I haven't read it yet. It's actually kind of hard to get your hands on, so if you have a copy of it, keep it. Um, I don't have one, and I'd like to get one, but they're kind of expensive because they're hard to find. So, um, yeah, I haven't had the chance to read that, but my what I've gathered is that it didn't really... I mean, it probably covered the rumors era because that was, like, their biggest time. Um, but it it was, like, 20 years ago or more. So this book is definitely more of... It's not a definitive history of Fleetwood Mac, but it definitely covers all the bases of all the varieties of Fleetwood Mac, starting out in the early 60s with Peter Green and... Um, uh, Danny Kirwan and uh, Jeremy Spencer and how they changed constantly throughout the years until they kind of settled with uh, Stevie and Lindsay when they joined the band and that's kind of when they shot to superstardom you know those two people brought so much character and personality to the band that was so distinct and that really made them Fleetwood Mac and the Fleetwood Mac sound that we all know today and I have come to love um, it was uh, super cool reading about that history. I'm not that familiar with the early stages of Fleetwood Mac. I have some albums, but I've never really dived into them the way that I have with the Stevie and Lindsay records. Um, there's just something about that time period that I find very magical and super, like, I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. There's just something about the music that I love. They were like the band that mixed pop and rock so perfectly and they did it so well and I love rock music and I love pop music I just and they mixed it they mixed it perfectly and I think that's probably why they're my favorite bands because they do something so well that not a, like sure there's a lot of pop rock bands out there but Blue Mac were classic um, so yeah I'm really enjoying this book it's uh, about probably 300 pages um, I'm on 278 right now and it's really really enjoyable um I didn't really have any expectations going into it I just thought it'd be like a normal music book and music biographies are my favorite books to read I just find them really inspiring and hopeful you know I love reading about how the people that I look up to got their start you know a lot of them had a hard time getting to that point where they were you know pretty memorable music and recognizable and really got the um recognition that they deserved and seeing how they got to that point makes me feel like there's hope and you know one day maybe there'll be a book about me and my songwriting I hope <laughs> um yeah so it's a cool book I mean there's lots of neat pictures there's like three sections of solid photos um which I which are neat you know that's one of my favorite parts about reading these books is the pictures because usually they're not ones that you can find on like google images you know there's these are straight out of their memory boxes at home so it's neat to see the ones that they pick and um, the little captions that they put it's just a glimpse kind of into their personal little world um, yeah um, and just yeah I read, definitely recommend it for any Fleetwood Mac fan it's, it's well written and it's funny like um, I don't know if it's just like British humor or what but I've been reading it on the train home for the past like week and there are times where I have to stifle my laughter like it's just I just want to giggle it's so funny and like out there like and the things he talks about too like he's totally open about the affair they have with uh, Stevie when he was still married to his first wife Jenny and you know their whole romance uh, with Jenny when they were growing up but it's just adorable like it's very cute um, he's very open about his uh, drug use and uh, alcohol binge nights <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, it's it's cool when they're honest and you feel like you really know them in a holy way. Um, that being said, having read about all the, the like, kind of affairs that he would have and the things that he did when he was high tainted my whole view of Fleetwood Mac, but I don't love them any less. They're still my favorite band. Um, I just... Times were different back then. That's all I'm going to say. Times were very different back then. <laughs> um, everything like that was part of the culture. So it was what everyone was doing. Everyone was partying and having ex excessive excess. Yes, yeah, so they were just partying in excess. Um, 
So, yes, that is Mick Fleetwood. Now then, and Fleetwood Mac, play on. I think it's called Play On. I know Georgia mentioned in last week's episode when she was talking about her books that holiday season's coming up and if you're looking to give a book for Christmas, I think they're the best books to give. And I don't mean like the downloadable copies that you get on like your little handheld book reader thing. Real books, paper that you can smell and, uh, you know, flipping through the pages you feel a sense of... Uh, Accomplishment when you see how many pages you've read like that's one of my favorite things about reading books Like I have them stacked up on my bookshelf. and just like yes I read all of those pages, you know, like pages that is like thousands and uh, you can't get that with uh, with a handheld anyways um, Yes book season Christmas season buy a book and buy this one by Mick Fleetwood. I mean look at that face. There he is candid Such a style eh? There he is on the back Just as cool just a little more white um, yeah, so uh, that's all I really wanted to talk about this week. Um, I don't think I have anything else. I've been pretty busy with a new job this past week, so I haven't really had too much time to dive into reading about what's going on in the music world, but I'm going to hopefully get back into that very soon, so I have more interesting things to talk about with you. Um, but please feel free to share anything that you know or have heard or reading about on our Facebook page or our Twitter. Um, Twitter is at Tad Podcast. Um, we'll put the little link thing here. Um, and our Facebook, you can find us at the Arts District Podcast. And our Gmail is Arts District, the Arts District Podcast at gmail.com. I should know that. We'll put that in here too. Um, please get in touch with us and let us know what you think about the podcast, you know, improvements or comments and suggestions and um, ideas for stories that we can talk about. We're always looking for new things, and we really appreciate some feedback. So that's it for me this week, um, my segment of episode 15. Uh, looking forward to what George has got to say this week. I don't know what she's going to talk about, so I'll find out when you find out, and uh, we'll enjoy it together. All right, so I've just watched Lauren's segment, and um, unfortunately I haven't checked out the Sonic Highways yet either. Um, we'll have to do a screening party. Um, I've got a couple stories to talk about today, or not so much stories as things that are going on. Um, yesterday, today is Saturday, Saturday afternoon, um, yesterday I was able to check out the Michelangelo Quest for Genius exhibition at the AGO, um, Art Gallery of Ontario. And I just wanted to tell you what I thought of the exhibit. Um, it was really well put together. Um, I'm someone who's interested in how exhibitions are executed, and from that standpoint, it was brilliant. Like, there was totally a tone set, um, the lights were dim, probably in part to protect these uh, drawings that are like 500 years old, but also to create this whole mood and atmosphere surrounding them. Um, the walls were all dark colored and sort of matte finish, really velvety, and the whole thing was, it was just a really lush experience. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed it. Uh, just seeing the skills, like the masterful skills in all of these drawings was amazing, and totally inspired me to work more in my drawing courses in school. Um, just the knowledge of the human form, and obviously that comes with hours and hours and hours and hours of study, um, but just incredible, incredible um, skill and depiction. Uh, they also had lots of architectural drawings, um, some things that had never been built, as well as um, video of actual buildings that were completed and in their settings now. And they had um, a few elements where they had taken the drawing or they had taken video of the um, building and then sort of like laying the drawing over top of the video or sort of transitioned from the um, drawing into the video so you could sort of see how things came together. Um, I remember also when I first talked about this exhibition a few weeks ago on the podcast, um, 
wondering about animations that they mentioned in the description and I saw those and they were incredible. Um, again, they sort of took the drawing and you could see the drawing and then they would like tilt it back and make the building grow from the drawing, which it's hard to explain, but um, they were renderings of what f the buildings would look like completed and they had sort of in shown how the light would shine inside the rooms or um, how light would cast shadows across the um, exterior of buildings and stuff. And they sort of moved around the spaces that he was trying to create, um, all based on these renderings that they had. Um, so that was really neat to see uh, and think about because I do some super basic animation stuff. So it was really, interesting to see that executed based on these like 500 year old drawings you know history and technology coming together I've mentioned before is totally my thing so I really really enjoyed checking that out um what else do I have to say about that um just so you know it is again October 18th to January 11th of 2015 so You've got a while to see that still, um, and it's definitely worth checking out if you're at all interested in drawing or architecture or anything like that. Um, clearly, Michelangelo was brilliant um, and driven to constantly recreating. Um, there was an interesting wall text that mentioned that um, Paper was kind of a new invention. They had been using vellum before that, which was like an animal skin for writing and drawing and stuff like that. So paper was super cheap compared to its predecessor and easy to get your hands on. So that's why he was able to create all of these drawings all the time. But at the same time, he would just write down or draw on anything that was near him. So a lot of the um, drawings have like drawings over top or multiple drawings on one page, or you can see writing through or another drawing through um, from the other side. So I found that really interesting. It just seems like you think of these people as these great masters and talented and everything, but to see this sort of human side was really interesting um, because I do the same. Like I have drawings on top of drawings and you can see things through pages from other pages and um, it just sort of connects you to this person because obviously he was a person. Um, yeah, so I'd say check out that exhibition. Um, my only confusion on it was that there were lots of sculptures by Rodin in the exhibition, and which was cool. Um, I just wasn't entirely clear on why they were there. I mean, they did draw connections, like how Rodin was really inspired by Michelangelo, like 400 years later, you know, but... Um, there were times when it the connection was confusing and I was a little bit lost. Um, but that's my only uh, complaint about the exhibition. Everything was incredible and it's worth checking out for sure. So the second story I wanted to talk about is a new biennial that's going to be happening. Um, if you don't know, there's sort of a history of biennials. Um, a large one that sticks out in my mind is the Venice Biennale. So it happens every two years and countries from all over the world send artists to represent them at, at a pavilion that um, is that country's pavilion. Uh, and the artist creates an artwork or a series of artworks that represent that country at that Biennale. Um, so this new Biennale that's happening is in Chicago and it's the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, its first year will be next year, so October 2015 is the first of it, and it's going to be uh, North America's largest survey of architecture, and its whole sort of aim is to get people thinking about architecture and the future of architecture. Uh, so I think this is going to be super cool. There's going to be exhibitions and installations, and They've commissioned a series of photographs of Chicago's architecture, like aerial photos and stuff like that, which I think is really cool. Um, Chicago has an interesting history of 
uh, architecture because I know early in their history there have been a couple of huge fires that wiped out large parts of their downtown and there were sort of mass rebuildings uh, all at one time so you get these huge sections that are like a glimpse of what architecture was at that time like I think in the early 1900s and stuff like that um, so it's a pretty cool city and definitely influential in architecture so I think it's fitting that they're having the architecture um, biennial to sort of crush all architecture or events in North America um, yeah also in Chicago um, there's Frank Lloyd Wright uh, who is a famous American architect he did some of his early work in the suburbs of Chicago um, so yes Chicago has a huge architectural history and um, I'm looking forward to see seeing where this uh, biennial goes like I realize this is the first year but it'll be interesting to see how it evolves and gets people talking about architecture because I think architecture is huge it makes a big difference um, I know that in choosing to go to Humber's Lakeshore campus where I'm in school now um, the campus itself was a huge part of my decision there are these amazing renovated old sort of um, cottage style buildings um, and it's probably at least half of why I decided to come here is that it's just an amazing space to just be so uh, yeah architecture is a big deal and people should be talking about it because it's a huge part of our lives it's literally the spaces we live in and I think that's a big thing so I'm looking forward to the Chicago uh, architecture biennial so just one more thing I wanted to mention before we wrap this episode up. Um, if you're in the area, the Gladstone Hotel is having a Wes Anderson inspired exhibition from November 11th to the 23rd. Um, yeah, it's called The Wild Wild West and it's artists from across Canada um, for sure and I don't know, maybe even further um, that have just created small artworks based on Wes Anderson films. So definitely worth checking out if you're interested in Wes Anderson's films at all. I know that um, I really enjoy his work. There's just such a distinct style, and I think it's it'll be neat to see other artists interpreting that style and playing off of that. Um, yeah, so if you're in the area, November 11th to the 23rd, check out that exhibit at the Gladstone. So, Sunday night. This was the Arts District Podcast, episode 15. And we'll see you for episode 16 next Sunday night. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.